Welcome to another edition of our weekly uh, Lessons Learned. I'm really excited this week to speak with Nadia Elfertasi, and we're going to be discussing um, building healthy security culture. I'm really excited, Nadia, to hear what you have to say from your experience. Nadia, if you'll just kind of take a moment and introduce yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Ailet. I'm also very happy to be here uh, again. Last time we spoke was a few months ago already. It was a fascinating conversation. Yes. The background hasn't changed. I, I have a corporate in the meantime, so that's the only <laughs> Some plants that are actually alive and not dead, so I also bought new plants. But the, other, the rest of the background is still the same. So for those uh, who don't know me, I'm Nadia Fatasi, uh, uh, founded Thrive with EQ, Emotional Intelligence. And I come from NATO. I worked there for almost 20 years in uh, crisis management security and always in the area of digital transformation and cybersecurity. So my main job throughout my positions was always that bridge between technical and non-technical people across mm -hmm variety of disciplines and stakeholders, right? And already there, because for us, uh, with our soldiers and civilians on the mission in the field, technology, uh, that infrastructure, lives depended on it, right? So cyber right. was an increased risk. So we really already very early on incorporated that the cultural aspect, the behavioral aspect, the people aspect, right? How do you get people to secure their digital footprint? Because we were always a person of interest, right? From right. The commercial espionage or whatever it is. And I took down those learnings and really incorporated in my passion for understanding people, understanding how we can communicate better for better outcomes, understanding how we can collaborate better for better outcomes. And especially now, uh, because COVID has exaverated you know, the surface mm -hmm. for social engineering, for manipulating people, fraud, right. and scam. And we always speak about human vulnerability and human weakness. And I like to empower people and, and turn that vulnerability into empowerment, right? Not necessarily turning them into human shields, I'll get into that in a moment. How can we, you know, um, make security a cultural transformative change where technology is is part of it, but people are not technology. So we, are, we cannot be programmed. Right. I mean, right. We're I mean, definitely wild cards. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, just look at our offspring. If I, at least my offspring, I don't know about you, I tell him to do A, on purpose, he's going to do the whole alphabet except for A. <laughs> yes, yes. And when I let go and I appreciate, then his, you know, testosterone increases, his peacock opens, and then he starts doing more. <laughs> I'm not suggesting any way or form that we should start doing this at the workforce. I'm just the anecdote. <laughs> but it's interesting though right because we're we we are trying to get people to you know do certain behaviors or take on certain mindsets so that their behaviors will change um and how do you do that short of brainwashing them you know like, you know or hypno hypnosis you know um and i think that's you know where we're trying you know we used to come at it right from compliance and everybody has to take it and from a very you know like um you know, you have to penalize people, right? And they get, you know, all the negatives, but it, we've seen that doesn't work and there is a new shift happening. But with that shift, you know, it takes a lot of understanding of human nature and understanding of good communication. So let's like talk about that a little bit. Um, and what are your thoughts and how have you seen it in the past in the organization through NATO and how you work with your clients now to achieve that? Yeah. Uh, for all very good points, very challenging points as well, because uh, I think in general there are a couple of distinct distinctions to make. First, when we talk about, let's talk about compliance, right? When we do exercise compliance by fear, what do what will people do? People will address the fear, not the root cause of their mm. insecure behavior, right? Right. So they have short-term instant results. But when you incentivize people, when you influence people, when you use persuasion skills and not command and control skills, 
how powerful is it if someone changes because they want to change and they understand why they have to change, then it becomes more sustainable. Mm-hmm. So you talk about security awareness, but when you think about it, awareness is being aware that not having a multi-factor authentication, so a second device or a second means to verify that it's actually you that's logging in, is important, will put you at risk. Every common sense person is aware of this, right? Still, I think over 80%, perhaps, and I'm just wild guess, I'm not basing this on any statistics, uh, is not necessarily using multi-factor authentication. Even uttering the word in some in, you know, organizations or, or in some circles will get people saying, oh, no, that's too complex, or people will be afraid, etc. But that's just common sense understanding that. Understanding, however, is you are aware that MFA is important, but understanding is actually having it implemented and knowing that any criminal or scammer will have a very difficult time, not impossible, but difficult time to log into your Google Drive, to log into your website, right? To log into your database where you have all clients' data, perhaps. And and, right. and you may say we have secure cloud. This is where, again, the preparedness comes in. And then you have to be prepared to also implement it. So let's say we are all very busy, right? We're just talking about it. Our attention span gets smaller and smaller. People don't even talk to you if you don't come with the elevator pitch uh, immediately. Now, imagine if you have a fear-based culture uh, or even not a fear-based culture. People are just high performing and need to deliver within deadlines. Mm -hmm. The VPN of the computer doesn't work or the email is, you know, blocked and you need to go home to take care of your offspring, for example, whatever. What do many people do, unfortunately, still? Gmail their documents, they upload to do their Google Drive. It is an unsecure area, right? So then it right. becomes a, a people aspect. And if you don't have MFA uh, installed, the risk is even higher. So th- right. this is what I mean, understanding the, the, the compliance piece and understanding that there's a difference between telling people what to do by having them watch very routine videos or read policies that are Mm -hmm. six pages long that in a time where our brain is overloaded with stimuli is not going to register and then kind of them from not being a human firewall, it's just not sustainable. So that is one part, right? Understanding, not looking at building this culture with a people-centric approach and mindset, right? Yes, you all have due, due, due English, Nadia, due diligence to, to, to secure our way of life. One of your guests, I don't remember his name, but I loved what he said. You don't secure anymore from nine to five. It's a way of life because we work remotely, mm-hmm. we work everywhere. Uh, but it's also, how do you find that balance between compliance because of due diligence and also incentivizing, right? And it's not only training, it's the way we communicate to each other. Hey, Mm -hmm. let me show you how to set up MFA. It's actually really easy. And when you just do it, right, you create this habit and then it becomes second nature. And this is the Mm -hmm. benefit for you because your data will be much more secure. And then you also uh, don't have to worry, right, about uh, non-compliance with law, etc., or uh, whatever it is. Really, on looking from the the benefit, also communicating the outcome, the impact. Now, how do we change behavior or habits? Right, we don't necessarily want to change behavior. Some people hear behavioral change and they all go, "Oh, this is neuroscience. This is behavioral. She's they, trying to brainwash me, etc." Not at all. Right, we have habits. We brush our teeth, hopefully three times a day. My son, impossible to get him to brush his teeth three times a day. (laughs) And it's a habit. (laughs) Exactly, it's a habit. There is a reward function, there is an action involved, there is a cue involved, and there is a reward. And over a period of time, it becomes second nature. No one necessarily thinks about how they dress in the morning. 95% of our behavior is driven subconsciously, which is very important. Mm -hmm. So, Understanding that a lot of things we are doing because we value speed over time 
are insecure behaviors. I was explaining during one of my trainings how I adopted MFA in the beginning. It was frustrating because I had to look for my phone. I had to, you know, always, and when my phone was not charged. So, and I was then stressed because I had to connect immediately. Everything was urgent. Mm -hmm. so I really changed my mindset and saying everything that's important is not urgent. Everything is urgent is not important. The world is not going to stop spinning. If Nadia connects to Zoom five minutes later, someone else's yeah. world maybe stops spinning, right? But not my world. And then I reboot the computer, I, or I recharge my telephone, etc. And I become less stressed about it. So mm -hmm. stress response comes from the mean. I'm talking a lot, there, so feel free to cut me off. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's very interesting. So <laughs> trying to have, a, have it all in my head. So I'm trying to, to to convey it in a way that is comprehensible. But we get, we feel a lot of additional stress to the meaning we give, right? So if we already feel, right, if we have a conflicting belief that installing multi-factor authentication is a stressful act, before doing it already, we are not going to feel that incentive reward for doing it, right? We're going to try to cut corners because it feels discomfort. Right. Changing and right. doing the habit is discomfort, right? So... Understanding how change happens to us, but disruption happens within us, and that discomfort, and explaining that to people and making it easier for them, right, to have mm -hmm. it as a lifestyle, mm -hmm. will help implement new habits. You cannot expect a very secure behavior from your people if you are leading based on fear, stress, and speed. Hmm. It doesn't go together. Because what will people do? If someone has performance anxiety, right, they will do everything in their power to deliver as soon as possible in the most insecure way as possible. Security becomes a back right. Okay? right. So how do you how do you oh go ahead? I know that I was just going to stop there. Um so, uh, so you know, with that the 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 speed and the fear, you know, knowing that people behave this way, right? And knowing that any new you know, new information and new behaviors initially are, you know, fought against. Um, how can awareness managers in trying to, you know, address that kind of head on, right? How can they um, kind of create ways to, you know, help their, their staff members, you know, th when they're trying to implement new change? Um, so first off, they need to have it. Uh, Gabby, Gabby summarizes it. Well, how do you change habits at scale? Yeah, exactly. Very good point. So first, um, uh, let me just explain when it comes to security awareness and information security. I'm working a lot actually with, tech, with, with information technology people or security people because first they need to uh, understand how to apply emotional intelligence to get buy-in and change behaviors first, right? Mm -hmm. Have that vocabulary to understand. So first, we work on the emotional intelligence part. Not necessarily because they have low levels of emotional intelligence, not at all. But there is a lot of uh, resistance to adopting information security as a partnership, as a way of life, right. and as a cultural change from other units or other departments. So right. that is the first part, I think, when it comes to information security or information technology, to really give them the tools, the toolbox to implement it it is one the second the culture the leadership is has to be on board mm -hmm. it's like a motor and oil the, the motor won't uh, turn without the oil right we can right. give people all the tools and back and, and and techniques and how to be secure but if there is no system cultural transformation change right that, that includes mm -hmm. it, it's not going to last this is the other. Right. And then at scale, I'm actually working. It's a long-term project, but we 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 have we are we have to rethink how we do trainings. It's not necessarily bringing in someone for two hours or eight hours a week to training, and then we are secure. It's not necessarily have people just mandatory watch training online, right? Videos, and then mm -hmm. they ah, of course, I know how to think when I'm clicking. Our brain is organ, flesh, and blood. It is most important job is to help us survive not necessarily to think it shocks a lot right. of people but when you think about it when you experience a stress response your body your brain is going to help you survive and you can feel different levels of stress in different contexts 
So if you, mm -hmm. for example, are mm -hmm. fraud and they are using, in, during ransomware attacks, they're using the fear technique a lot, even if you're the most brilliant, secure person on, or on, 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 on the world, if they're using words and, and, and techniques and situations that will trigger fear in you, you're not necessarily going to think from your rational part of the brain, prefrontal right. part. You're going to go from the hippocampus, right, where the fight, flight, or freeze mode right. is related. So understanding that is really important. How can you do this at scale? Design training that is experimental learning, where people actually experiment. There's one element is building an understanding, being talked at, being lecture. But how do people learn? For discussion, by feeling, when the emotional intensity is at the same, the same uh, uh, belief. And you can design a lot of scenarios. You don't necessarily, you know, you can do virtual reality. You can do mm -hmm. 360. It's the, the, the igniting people basic senses, right? That they understand, right? That they can actually see if you are working from home and your offspring is pressuring you and you're giving them your devices or access and then criminals can spoof the clone that, you know, get your identity access or if you are working on a deadline and, you know, because we, when we are in it, we are only in the moment. We don't see the complete picture. So we don't right understand the impact so this and i do this as well i design trainings but uh this is how it can be a skill because then you have this program that is experimental learning and then you have the live training the consultancy that you know working with technical parts as well business risk as well with all the units but mm -hmm. at least you train your people at skill as a, as a foundation but and i think it's a big step which not many people are willing to take Right, because we were used to think of security in one way, and, mm -hmm. and if you imagine for 20 years you've been writing documents and you've been implementing policies and standards, and all of a sudden some woman in Brussels comes and says, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, probably want to, you know, uh, hit or well, they can't leave studio, studio, but you know, not listen. And it's normal. I think understanding that some people are at higher levels of flexibility. They mm -hmm. are more open to change. They see change as yeah. opportunity. Others as a threat, and you need to respect that. And this is where you have, you know, you know, change champions. This is where you have understanding. How can we go step by step as well? Mm -hmm. what the most. This is how what we did at NATO. A lot of people ask, you know, why did NATO not? Uh, is not so much at the forefront when it comes to terrorism versus investing in more in defensive capability, hard uh, core capability. It comes actually from a calculation, risk calculation, right? The, okay. the, first of all, terrorism, this is not necessarily related to this topic, but just to give the understanding, terrorism is, is, is not necessarily in their main portfolio. That's more United Nations. It's more a national sovereign uh, uh, issue. But the impact, right, of terrorist attacks, lives are killed. It's huge. But can you imagine the impact of a nuclear attack, right? On, on, on Europe, cities, etc. That impact is unimaginable. So this is how they calculate risk and invest resources accordingly. So when you apply mm -hmm. the thinking and understanding, you cannot do everything. You're not going to do everything, right. right? Especially if you're a small business, you don't even have the uh, resources perhaps to invest in technicalities. This is why the people aspect is also so important. What will have the biggest business disruption, right? What is the biggest, you know, ransomware, for example? It's it's a, it's a reality. It's a high risk for any business. Right. Then take steps towards that. You don't have to, uh, but you need to take a perspective and calculate what will have the biggest impact on my business and always have a unit or always have moments where you're not always in firefighting mode. The more you will stay in firefighting mode, the more you will, you know, deplete yourself, <laughs> deplete your, your team. Yeah. You're not secure as well, right? Because you're 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 reacting instead of responding. Exactly. And yeah, and we want we want people to be able to have the skill set to stop. You know, see the flag, stop, take a step back, and go. Wait a minute. You know, and then yeah. respond instead of having those knee jerk reactions. And and that takes that does take practice. I think it's interesting what you were saying earlier. You know about um, 
training people and creating the immersive experience, it kind of sounded to me, and maybe um, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of along the idea of gamification for security training, right? Where it's not just, um, you know, hit this and you, you know, you report a fish, yay, but, but actually giving them the experience or giving, you know, there's so many different aspects and approaches to what gamification could mean. Um, yes. But it's letting people play with it, right? And see if I do this, then this happens and without I any. Exactly. And and I, I, I get so excited about stuff with Phil. Apologies if I interrupt you. But no, I what's happening is, for example, when we look at virtual reality training, they are using the tool to enhance the tool, but not necessarily tailored to the need. So first, what needs to happen is understanding the organizational need. If you have a company mm. As for example, Gen Z or you know a lot of millennia, you know young, uh, and I'm not saying that older people. I love gamification as well, but that have like very technical savvy, digital savvy people. You probably mm -hmm. want to have experimental learning that is virtual reality that has a lot of gamification, etc. If you have an organization that is much more diver generational diverse, that I get dizzy when I put on goggles. I am not going uh -huh. to. <laughs> puts me off totally, right? You're probably not going to have a lot of traction. And there, the, right. the technology is there to adapt it to serve your purpose. So I think first understanding yes. what are the requirements, what are the needs, what are the the, the, uh, the business brand, the profile, et cetera, the employee values, the employee experience, how do you build that resilient employee experience, and how you use the tools, which immersive experience is one way of doing it at scale, but there are there comes many aspects come to that it's a it's a transformational change program to implement that so i think the tools and technologies are there but right. understanding how do you get people to do things differently on the mm -hmm. job on the job means also at home also at 10 o'clock in the evening you don't work anymore from nine to five right right and under and, and understanding the cultural aspect and building first the aha moments in their mind so they have they are open to change someone does not understand it why should they leave their comfort zone why should they change then you're going to have barriers and yeah. events, right it doesn't matter how many times they see it etc but when they right. when we change when we are emotionally triggered or when we have feel that emotional intensity right mm -hmm. this is why marketers of psychology are very and this is what unfortunately disinformation is using a lot we use pictures sometimes even fake pictures of, of yeah. children crying or etc and then we are right. all on the internet commenting etc and without most even time, checking yeah it's, okay, it's fake is that emotion yeah. makes us human we shouldn't get rid of this, right. right but i think right understanding that i also sometimes i still watch a movie and then i get emotional etc and then after that i'm like okay don't go do something right now because you are much more vulnerable for being scammed my son right. taught me that because children are the best social engineering engineering uh, uh, officer in the world yes they are so you know i want to i want to make sure um we address this with um what what do you define as a healthy security culture, right? Yeah. Um, so we're talking about different ways we can build it, but but how does someone kind of know and be able to identify? Yes, I'm I'm on my way towards that, or we're we're in the right track. Yeah. So I'll first start with context, and then I'll start with some tools that you can use to actually measure. Okay. So the, the the other day someone asked me, you know, what do you mean with healthy security, Nadia? Do you think we are unhealthy? We are not fit? And and I and and you see words matter and we all give different meaning to, to associations. Mm -hmm. We often hear positive security culture, right? And we need to build a positive security culture, which is uh, it's it's good. The problem is with, with if you use positive security culture, you assume that people have to only be positive about security, that they perhaps, or maybe you don't assume, maybe people feel pressured to uh, not make mistakes and then hide the error. There are research available of, I think, a high amount, even more than, you know, in, in a certain area they did this research, that around 50% don't even report their, their IT incidents, right, because of fear of judgment. So if you have a positive security culture the the perception you may trigger and if i make mistakes I, i'm i'm not aligned i will be judged i may be disciplined i may be left out right i'm not as part of everyone 
understanding that people do make mistakes, no matter how perfect right. you are. I make, if I got a dollar for every mistake I made, I would be multi, triple <laughs> there. <laughs> and, and this is how our brain learns as well, to have a new response option. Right. So understanding is, it's, it's more kind of, I use healthy security to always find that balance, right? The, between the positive and the neg negative. What, ha what do you as an organization do, right? How do you help your people come forward in a psychological safe space environment? I messed up. I clicked on the link or, you know, I went on or I got scammed on Tinder. Mm -hmm dating app. Romance scams are real and they're affecting organizations. Right. These are your people that are getting fraud. And right? Right. It's because loneliness, isolations, they, they are extremely well in building up that credibility and replicating sites, etc. that you don't even think that it may be, you know, fraud. What do we do when we are in love? You know, we ignore the red flags. We only we see throw things out. <laughs> One day life is miserable. The other day is like, I'm in heaven. Like God, <laughs> it's the hormones. It's yeah. the hormones, right? And I think, uh, and that's just part of being human nature, but the culture is really important to give that safe space to, to not make people feel judged about mm -hmm. something and having it healthy. The other thing I will say is, you know, we don't, we're not in a necessary luxury position to start using uh, only positive emotions or incentives to have build healthy security postures. The risk is high. Scams are right. happening on a daily basis. IT teams and CISOs are overloaded every single day. So I right. think there is, a, there is a due diligence of people needing to also do their part of the job, right? And, and it's important. It's important to take security seriously. But if you only come from a very serious place and only like heavy uh, compliance sphere, then you're not going to reach, you know, your target audience. You're not necessarily going right. to reach. So what I mean with healthy is the equilibrium, right? Mm -hmm. I am uh, currently in this moment a healthy person. My blood pressure is okay. Uh, I, I lost a tooth or two, so I'm still healthy, okay, right? But if I lose my front teeth, then I may be on health. You know, um, I think that's a, a really good um, analogy to another point I had on that previous conversation. Um, you know, what we consider a healthy person is not like it's not necessarily one parameter, right? It's it's a combination of things. And if, okay, maybe you have a missing tooth or maybe your blood pressure is a little bit on the high end, you know, it's not like this perfect setting. Um in a conversation um, with Paula West on a previous live, um, you know, she was saying how, you know, how they educate their people to know that even if they click on a link, you can still come to us because there's still time. We can still exactly. stop and have an effect. You can still make a positive effect for the company, you know, even if you clicked. Right. So like there's, you know, there's many points along the line that you can still contribute to the security and safety. You don't have to be afraid, even if you made an oops. Right. And so that doesn't mean that the company is not safe or secure. Right. And doesn't mean they're not healthy. Um, it just means, OK, so, you know, it's this constant ebb and flow. I think we as a culture set, you know, just um, I think just we have this idea of perfection. And then when we say something is good, it's we mean perfect. And that's not how we need to be measuring things. We need to understand the ebb and flow of life in general, right? Like we're going to have better days and worse days. And we're, we make a mistake. You were saying this to me uh, before we went live, you know, you don't judge yourself for it, right? You just pick up, move on and say, okay, well then what am I going to do moving forward? And I think kind of trying to convey that and create that within the culture also, you know, will help build that foundation for a stronger and more healthy security that I think we're trying to achieve. And, and this is very much linked to stress because when we feel stress, mm -hmm. we respond differently. So it's very difficult to be, uh, to show empathy or to display empathy and understanding that also from a leadership perspective, how mm -hmm. do I train my managers? How do I, how do I hold my leaders accountable for their teams? Right. It's, it's like, it's a, it's a partnership and, and, and having that culture is so important because then people, you know, we make mistakes. We, we everyone makes mistakes. And there's a, a brilliant article, which is not so brilliant when you, I mean, <laughs> outcome perspective in the new yorker when this uh the hacker and the cia 
leaked to WikiLeaks how the most sophisticated coders were sharing passwords on post-its with, post with each other and the very, you know, very uh, easy passwords, etc. because part of it, because maybe of high workload, but part of it of this arrogance will not happen to me or I'm mm. a tech person, I'm a coder, I know this, etc. And this is where our ego or brain may trick us. And it's always, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I am confident, but I'm not, I, I know I, I'm vulnerable to attacks as well. Right? I right. live as I would be compromised. My right. I can be compromised. So I reduce the risk as best as I can. And I feel right. safe doing so. And I think the, the other thing I want to say in terms of how do you measure this? So each organizations need to be, need to really make this risk calculation for themselves. What are the KPIs? What are the areas that are the most at risk if we would get hacked? Right? Would have mm -hmm. the business disruption. What behaviors do we want to see? And then you have your scorecard. And then you have different strands of work where you measure it. But not, and this is where you have to find the balance. You're not measuring it to shame or blame people. Right. It's only human nature when, when you know, we see this on the, on the internet so much. We judge all the times, <laughs> even the way we write, etc. because it makes yeah. us feel better if someone else is wrong versus yeah. understanding that People make mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens, and there's a you know there's a physiological impact as well. At the end of the day, right. there are people. Everyone tries their best in a different way. And if someone is very different than us, this is where health is, the collaboration part is very important with emotional intelligence. It's very easy to work like you and I like each other very much. So we probably, hopefully, if we would work together, we'd get along pr pretty well, right? But let's say if, if you have someone in front of you who has different values to you than you, has a very different mindset than you, has different priorities, right? If you're going to focus on trying to change me to in order to get your work done, etc., mm -hmm. it's going to be extremely frustrating, stressful. Um, right. You're just gonna you know get more job, more work out of it, and less uh, less pleasure. As people, we seek pleasure, avoid pain. One of the two. Mm -hmm. So it is understanding how you can even build relationships, even when you don't like someone. And this is where you find the balance, because there is a personal incentive incentivizing people. But there is also, if you work for your organization, it's due diligence that you take care of how you of your online behavior. Right. When you leave your desk or when you are in a remote, don't leave your screen open for everyone to come, even if you think it's two minutes. You know, right. I, I always have my microphone here. When I'm not in meetings, I literally plug out because I don't know someone can connect and, you know, hack. Yeah. no one knows me now. But when, maybe one day I'll be very famous and they're like, ah, we're going to uh, hack Nadia's phone. They will have very interesting conversations, conversations <laughs> with Nadia and her offspring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. definitely so, which may inspire people but that's it I <laughs> camera or I my camera so just these little things right and sometimes right. I forget and I don't judge myself but I try to right. really have it as a way of life yeah and and I think that's a good point um you're saying about you know how we have a responsibility professionally even if we're having to deal with someone that we just don't mesh with you know, we just can't stand them for whatever reason we don't, or even if we can stand them, but they drive us crazy, just personality wise, we have a responsibility to find a way to communicate to them. And that might be going through a third party, right? Using an ambassador to communicate to those persons, but making sure they still get the message, right? Um, so I think that's a really good point. And it's not easy. Dealing with people is never easy um, or straightforward. But what would you say? I know we're, we're, we're a little over time. Um, so I just want to ask you this one last question. What would you say is some of the biggest hurdles um, that you see to building a healthy security culture? <laughs> people. <laughs> And there we have it. <laughs> if you want one word, it's actually people, right? It's, uh, yeah. no, I, uh, it's not fair. What I mean when it comes to it is, it is it's a challenge, but also an opportunity. Right? And mm -hmm. I think you really need to have, I love challenges. I, I really love challenges. But understanding that it's easy to program a software to do something differently. You go in there, you code, you clean up the bugs, 
you have you know firewalls, you change the coding, etc. It is you know it doesn't necessarily involve discomfort, emotion. It doesn't necessarily right. talk when you have low levels of assertiveness. You don't you know you like to talk within or think within. You don't need to deal with that. It doesn't involve to actually listening when you don't have time to listen. It doesn't involve to you know so all these people things. So that is the most challenging, but it's also an opportunity. One of the things that I said to one of the trainings I did is building, you know, we always, so we kind of wait until we need something to approach someone. Building relationships again and not hiding behind our screens. It's easy to Mm -hmm. send an email, right? To get your discomfort and then place it someone else. And there's there's no judgment here, but it's easy to be behind emails and screens. And, and I think when it comes to security, we see this a lot with IT, right? They get a lot of requests, et cetera. So from their perspective, they're just addressing the problem. They're not necessarily understanding the user. Right. Someone needs help, right, from IT. Maybe they are in a really difficult position and they can't do their work and they're extremely stressed because they're going to miss the deadlines. It's going to have an impact on the customer service they deliver. So they are in full stress mode, hippocampus of the brain. Or maybe you are in your prefrontal cortex. Please go to ticket one and raise a ticket, etc. You know, it's how do you want yeah. people to take security uh, um, uh, serious? So this is where the experimental learning comes in to really have it in a safe space to make people see and understand how emotional intelligence actually can uh, help you uh, collaborate, communicate, and get you the tools to implement it to better understand people to build relationships, have a coffee or have a talk with someone when you don't need anything. And one thing I knew in the military, when we were deployed, we we were very close and we had very healthy relationships. We knew if someone was in trouble, there was no question that we were there for each other. Absolutely no question. Also with local governments, et cetera, because we were in their territory and they're the ones that could help us immediately as well if something went wrong. So thinking also not so much about transactional relationships, but literally building uh, relationships, building rapport, taking the time. How would you feel? And I know this is not easy because I am extremely busy as well, as I said. But how would you feel if I haven't spoken to you in two years and all of a sudden I send you a message? Hey, Ailet, uh, how are you? Oh, this training that I'm delivering would be great for this and this. Can I get on? You're gonna think, who the hell does she think she is, and we're yeah. just, you know, you know, you're never gonna. Sounds like a lot of bad marketing, also. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. I'm not saying that you should build relationship just to get something from it, but just right. become comfortable having interpersonal skills. Become right. comfortable communicating from your prefrontal cortex. When you feel an, an emotion, let it dissipate. Right. right. Write your email. Don't send it. Uh, <laughs> scream to the garden or whatever or box etc emotion is energy in motion allow it to dissipate and then because this is how we burn bridges this is how we you know people's defense mechanisms get get up and and that takes a lot of investment and 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 time and being comfortable with being uncomfortable well, um, Danny was asking, um, what would you say a couple of concrete steps people could take today to start building a healthy security culture? So, so maybe one or two. Yeah. So you mean like in a company setting or personal, like a, a home setting? Company, within a company, or like an organization. So if you are information security awareness, I think that, you know, the, that comes from there. First of all, build understanding, build partnership around information security. So really have a program in place, whether it's through training, whether it's through virtual coffees, right? Look how you, you build, incorporate it in meetings, making it leadership priority as well, is change the perception about information security. Currently, it is additional work for me that I don't have the time for versus I can incorporate it in my day-to-day to work and my life will become better out of it. Second of all, don't use the same uh, information security uh, messages and policies for all your units. People have different needs. Coders need to understand how to have secure collaboration with third party and how where they get their information, right? How, how are they coding from multiple sources? 
marketing need to understand the, the, the information they're putting out there, right? How will it actually increase social engineering risk? Finance need to understand, right, the, 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 the cost of business disruption, how to mitigate it, how to invest in the right resources to reduce the cyber attack profile. CEOs need to know uh, uh, stakeholders, right? Uh, what is the regulatory landscape specifically for me and my organizations because they are being held liable as well? And what is the impact on my customers as well? When customers don't get their services or when their data is out there, there. They're even getting, you know, contacted by the ransomware attackers to put pressure yeah. back on the data. They're very creative, right? So uh, understanding that. So you need to have your security policy, but you, you need to really focus on the why and on the outcome and then build mm -hmm. your program around it. Training is just part of it. Right. That's a great. Those are great insights and um, kind of takeaways to get people started. There is no one direct thing because again like you said we're dealing with people um so it's a huge challenge that that the security awareness programs have but um it is possible and we have a going to do with a plug we have a, a a growing community for security awareness managers um where we have weekly meetups um to come and just talk it's freestyle we um, we'll usually have a, a topic of conversation, but then it's just open to everyone to contribute. And then we also have these weekly LinkedIn lives uh, with different members from our community. So thank you, Nadia, so much for joining me again. Okay. I love uh, learning from you. And please connect with Nadia um, on LinkedIn. You can find her and um, also with her Thrive with EQ. So thank you again. Thank you, Ayla. Thank you, everyone who joined.